So it's seven. Is it All time? right. Hi. My name is Hi, Suzanne. Suzanne. <laughs> Hi, Terry. Um, I want to thank everybody for joining us. Uh, I'm sitting here hosting a Google Hangout with Terry Lachlan, the founder of Total Immersion Swimming. My name is Suzanne Atkinson, and I'm a Total Immersion Master Coach, and I coach triathletes as well. Uh, first, before we um, introduce Terry further, I want to thank uh, sponsors for this Hangout, Finis and uh, Endurance Films. Um, if you hang out until the end, you'll be getting some information for some good uh, discounts for some of their products, so be sure you hang out until the end here. Um, so thank you very much to those two companies. Uh, Terry, welcome. Terry has been a swim coach for over 40 years. Uh, he started Total Immersion over 20 years ago and has quite a breadth of swimming personal experience as well as coaching experience. So thanks for joining us, Terry. Delighted to have another conversation with you, Suzanne. <laughs> and let everyone else eavesdrop on our conversation. Yeah. So what I'm really looking forward to is letting you guys know that uh, Terry and I have had a lot of opportunities to coach together at various clinics and uh, traveling to and from these clinics. And we have some really interesting conversations about swimming and how to improve and what sorts of things that he and I do in our personal swimming. And I hope that you guys can just sort of listen into our conversation that we have here for about the next 30 minutes. And there will be plenty of time for you guys to ask questions at the end. So I'm just going to go ahead and um, lead Terry through some questions, and I'll provide some input as well, but I'm really looking forward to hearing uh, Terry share some information here. So Terry, if you could pick only one swimming goal, what would it be? It would be the goal that changes your life, Suzanne. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that is um, the goal I've, I've had uh, for probably 20 years that I have every single day when I go to the pool, and that is to improve my swimming. Um, it's an all-purpose goal. It's always there with me. Uh, I never, ever, I used to do these things, but I never do them anymore. You know, like everybody else, I used to go to the pool to get the yards in, used to go to the pool to uh, get fit, uh, and so on. And now I, I am conscious when I step to the edge of the pool or the body of water uh, that my goal is when I emerge from that body of water, 45 minutes later, an hour later, I will be a better swimmer than when I got in. Mm -hmm. So can you give me some specific examples of uh, things that you've done in the past that were not necessarily improvement-minded? Um, yeah, I used, to, uh, I used to be conscious of the number of yards that I felt uh, was necessary either to be fit or to swim a 1650 or, you know, a, a variety of things. Um, I'm not unconscious of the fact that it requires a certain amount of training um, to, but I, I think more in terms of quality time, number of hours that I may have available uh, to swim in a week, it's got to fit into the other things I do in my life. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I was quite conscious of yardage and uh, whether I sh needed to do this set or that set, and I still do think about certain sets that I want to do, but the, you know, the preeminent thought in my mind um, and it, it actually was there for quite a while, I think, uh, implicit in my thinking before I really became conscious of the fact that I was thinking this way, that I was really going to the pool, and this is going back 10, 12 years or more, that I was going to the pool every day with the idea that in some way, in the next hour, I would swim better than I ever had in my life. Yeah, uh-huh. <laughs> You know, I've been to um, a number of pool sessions with you, and I have to say that uh, almost every time when I arrive at the pool and you're a much earlier riser than I am, you've just finished your set of whether it's 45 minutes or 90 minutes, and almost invariably you climb out of the pool with a huge smile on your face, and you rush to the board, uh, <laughs> speedo, towel, dripping wet, you rush to the board and begin making notes. And, uh, and it's just so exciting to see someone that, is just continuously looking for improvement-minded opportunities and, and so happy to share those with, uh, with other people. Um, I, do, you, do you have that experience every single time you swim or do you sometimes it's, have a day or two where it's things... It's true. It, you know, if, if for the people who happen to uh, be regulars on the discussion forum, they know that um, pretty soon with, after every single practice I do, uh, that I'm posting it and and uh, deconstructing it and debriefing myself on what I did and something that's pretty interesting is I 
I, I found after years of, of doing this that I can, if I've done 15, you know, 12 or 15 different repetitions and they've been at different tempos and, and distances and I've come in at different times, I can recollect all of them. <laughs> I, you know, it's really improved my memory. But I really am eager to go write it down. For me, in, in a way, it's not, somehow it's not as real until I've recorded it, until I've documented what I, what I did. And as I document, I, I kind of do some analysis because for, you know, for a lot of people who are following it on the discussion forum, I'm I'm also sort of trying to make my thinking transparent uh, mm -hmm. for the people who follow the practices. But absolutely, yes, I climb out of of the lake or the pool, and I'm just really eager to go uh, to my computer and 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 log it in the in the total immersion discussion yeah. forum. Yeah, I I think that's great. And um, one of my experiences has been that by writing it down myself and then with my athletes when I do have an athlete that will go to the same care of writing down their sets um, with as much detail as they can comfortably recall they begin to make faster and faster improvements on the other hand if uh, if someone comes back from the pool and does a set and has not yet acquired that ability or the desire to um, to tell me the pace or the timing of each repeat or are unable to currently count strokes, the improvement is is slowed down a little bit. It doesn't mean that they're not improving. Um, you know, I honestly don't think anybody goes to the pool with the goal of not getting better. Uh, I right. just think that not everybody knows how to go about getting better. So um, we'll get to some of those details about metrics shortly, but I know there's a lot of other things we want to discuss. Um, yeah. and you and I could talk about metrics forever. <laughs> because there's so so many possibilities. Well, on a subsequent webinar, we will. Yeah, perfect. Um, so you've done a lot of uh, of study of, uh, for example, aquatic mammals and how do aquatic mammals differ from terrestrial mammals? And can you let us know how that impacts how we should approach swimming? Well, it's you know the the. I think the idea is once I realized that the the problems we saw from all of our students that were you know we'd kind of see the same problems over and over, and uh, in the in the beginning I referred to it as human swimming, and uh, in the last five or six years I I think I came to realize that we shared characteristics with all terrestrial mammals, uh, and we're not meant to be good at swimming, and and the fact that we are terrestrial mammals and evolution didn't prepare us. Uh, to be good at swimming uh, has a result that, uh, and this has been measured by uh, engineers who work for the Defense Department, uh, that human swimmers uh, waste 97 percent of energy. Uh, these were not drowners, these were not Michael Phelps, these were people who thought of themselves as okay swimmers, uh, and, and they were only converting 3 percent of energy into, into locomotion. Uh, so when you know you're wasting 97% of energy, it really means you have pretty much limitless and lifelong opportunities to improve. <laughs> I mean, there are just so many things that you can do to reduce that that amount of energy waste and be more be more efficient. Sure. Uh, do, is there an upper limit, do you think, for improvement of conversion of efficiency into forward movement in the water? Well, you know. They, certainly, there's an upper limit. I, you know, they've they've said that uh, that the most uh, the most efficient swimmers on Earth, elite swimmers, are somewhere short of 10%. Mm -hmm. um, but I I think uh, functionally, I personally don't feel as if I will ever reach that upper limit. And mm -hmm. you know, in the 24 years I've been teaching and practicing TI myself, I have yet to glimpse. Uh, the limit of, of my improvement. I, you know, I, I swam in a lake uh, just about an hour and a half ago and I was focused uh, in a very specific way as I always am. Um, my, my focus today, I was swimming, it, it took about 10 minutes to swim across the lake and you know for each of those 10 minute laps across the lake I, I did two things, one of which I was very specifically focused on staying and feeling very, very stable in the water that my body line would never have any instability in it as I was recovering. Um, and at the same time as having that really clear goal, I actually, and I do this quite often, 
I was visualizing myself as if I was an outside observer. You know, I, in other words, I was there was a picture of my stroke as I swam <laughs> in my head, and I was I was visualizing it and connecting and comparing it to the sensations I had. Uh huh. Um, and it felt awesome. Every single stroke felt awesome. Yeah. But there wasn't one stroke where I didn't feel I can make this a little better, <laughs> and on the next stroke I will. Uh huh. Yeah, that's fantastic. I, and I really like that mindset. Um, you mentioned the idea of being an outside observer. A quote that I've run across twice within the last two or two weeks or so of just reading completely different sources. Um, how does it go? The athlete feels and the coach sees. So the swimmer. I combined in, those, didn't I? What's that? I said I, I was both athlete and coach since I was feeling and seeing. Exactly, and that's exactly my point. Um, I teach a, a weekly master's session, and one of, my, one of my favorite things to do is to find a really non-technical, simple uh, improvement for the warm-up set or maybe a drill set. And a lot of times I'm able to phrase something in a way that maybe they haven't heard or read before, and it has to do with what I'm observing about, this, about how they swim, and they don't currently have a way to feel that in the water. And I'll just give a, a specific example of that that sounds kind of similar to what you did. But um, a lot of people will do a, uh, a drill, whether you do the TI skating drill or if people have heard, heard it referred to a different way as the side kicking drill yeah. or the, the one arm lead drill or, or stat triple Or the lead. not on your side kicking drill or the, the not, on, not on your side not kicking drill. Right. <laughs> any, any version of that. So this is the cool thing it works with, with any version. A lot of people will do that and, and they, um, they'll kick hard enough to maintain forward movement, but that kick itself results in sort of a, a rocking back and forth of the upper body. So right. they're kicking, you know, on their side or slightly on their side, and their their shoulders are doing this the whole time. They're ratcheting. Yeah. yeah, and that's something I notice. I notice quite often, I don't do this so much anymore, but I used to have people do a lap in skate, you know, so it, what mm -hmm. essentially was a lap of kicking. But even if it was only 10 meters or so, uh, I would I would look to see if their shoulder was ratcheting back and forth. I would call their attention to it and yeah. say, "Notice that. Right. Bring your attention to that. Notice that. And what can you do to calm that down?" Yeah, and and so that's really great because you're it's an outside observation, and just by pointing it out, most people can fix it very easily. It just is something that they hadn't focused on before. And right. um, and your comment about swimming in the lake today and imagining yourself as an outside observer and trying to keep your body stable the whole time, is, that's a perfect example of, of self-coaching. Yeah. Um, and that's and actually that's an, an evolution because I used to spend a lot more time, probably as many other people do, visualizing Shinji <laughs> from that uh -huh. video that four million people have seen. And I, yeah. I think probably a lot of people take a, a mental loop of that video to yeah. the pool and, and so I used to spend a lot of time visualizing Shinji and from time to time I will specifically his toe flick his yeah. very light very <laughs> compact toe flick but now I find that I am I'm much more likely to be visualizing myself I have seen some video but it's not video that I've seen that I'm visualizing I'm really connecting the sensations I'm feeling and creating a visual moving image as if I was watching myself. That's fantastic. Um, and I, I've started to do more of that myself. I do want to get back to some of these sensations because I think that people can really gain a lot from hearing uh, some specific sensations. If they can go straight to the pool tonight or if you're on the West Coast tonight uh, or tomorrow and try some of these things out. But yeah. you and I had, uh, had wanted to cover some other things that have to do with improvement. Yeah. And again, like I mentioned before, I don't think anybody goes to the pool not wanting to improve. They just don't know how to improve. And um, there is frequently a struggle when people see that their um, speed has plateaued right. or their, their ability to execute um, 10 by 100 repeats on a right. 140 send-off. They're just not getting better and they feel stuck and they get very frustrated at that point. What, um, in your reading, uh, you know, you had mentioned some uh, some information about chess masters and you know a growth mindset yeah. what, what can we learn from that well when you talk about people who you don't believe and I, I agree with you that people are not really going to the pool with an idea of not to improve <laughs> but I think the the um, that the mindset you have at the pool where you're swimming in the way I am and you are 
uh, on a routine basis and it just becomes natural to do it. Uh, it starts before that it starts with the cultivation of a larger way of looking at yourself um, and and so there's been uh, you know when I started reading about this in the late 90s and early aughts that you know that I found that there was already about 25 years of really serious academic research and and what this research was into was is there a gene for excellence and what they found was no there's not a gene for excellence there are you know there are natural advantages people have in, in, in a lot of things but in, in almost any discipline they looked at it's you know no it will surprise no one that the vast majority of people are underachievers and and you know one way they put it was that people get to the okay plateau uh, mm -hmm. and they might be working at something for three months four months five months and they're improving a lot learning a lot and then they get, get to a certain point after a period of months and they just stop improving now why did they stop improving um, and when they did a lot of interviewing and deep study of this, uh, they found out that one, because we tend to consider ourselves average, why shouldn't we consider ourselves average? And we don't really feel like we um, sort of have the stuff to rise above, to really be distinguished in a certain in a certain way. That's part of it. And part of it is just complacency. That's why they call it the OK plateau. You feel like <laughs> your skills are good enough to uh -huh. get the job done on some level where you're not completely dissatisfied uh, and, and so on. Um, and so what is different about the small number of people who don't get stuck on the OK plateau? And, you know, so we were talking about chess masters and, and one of the best studies about that was uh, described in uh, Scientific American magazine about five years ago. And uh, what, what they do is that cognitive specialists often use chess as a place to study um, cognition and how people think about things and so on because obviously it's a, it's a really mental uh, sort of activity um, and so the really interesting study they did was they looked at people who were at the 2400 level which is like a life master in chess uh -huh. and then the 2000 level was the grand master and then the 1600 level, I don't know if that the terms are, are right, but, but as you move down in that rating system to fewer points, you're, you're not as excellent a chess player. And one of the things is if a 2400 player plays a 2000 player, 75% of the time they're going to win. They know that. So that predictability makes it good to study. So they know that there are certain mental capacities like chunking um, mm -hmm. it, that are, are very very useful in chess so when they studied the mental capacities the chunking and so on they saw no difference at all between the cognitive capacity of the 1600 player the 2000 player the 2400 player so they thought you know it since their cognitive capacity is is not different and this is a cognitive game mm -hmm. how do the 2400 players get to that level and they found it was really simple they when they interviewed they found, talked to the 1600 level players and when they got to 1600 they thought I'm good enough. The 2,000 <laughs> level players, the same thing, and the 2,400 level players never had that thought. Even at 2,400, they still didn't have that thought. I'm good yeah, enough. Amazing. So they were just constantly hungry to to get better at the thing. Uh huh. So that seems to be inborn in certain people, right? Because it's mm -hmm. not there for everybody. Uh, why is it there in this small number? But I think the empowering thing is that once you are aware that all it takes is that thought that I can improve, I can improve limitlessly, yeah. and if I just maintain that idea, keep that idea alive, I can improve. Well, you will. <laughs> uh -huh. it's, it's so empowering. That's and, I, and, you know, going back to swimming, it's, I think it's a per, an amazing vehicle, all right, for, for putting that to, to work because we're not supposed to be good at swimming. Um, so you know, we it's it's such a great vehicle for you know for not only promoting good health, uh, but for learning the behaviors and mindsets of what Tim Ferriss calls uh, meta learning, uh, the ability to learn anything prodigiously. Um, so that's why I love love teaching and practicing swimming. Uh, yeah. Once we crack the improvement code in swimming, we can. <laughs> we can apply those lessons to anything else. Yeah. Well, so I just listening to you um, to talk, and, and you and I have had these chats often, and that's um, one of the, the great things about being able to get together with 
um, with you in particular, but other swim coaches, is the, throwing these ideas back and forth. Uh, I'm constantly getting new ideas, and what I'm picking up tonight is kind of an, a new baseline framework. So we've already talked about the efficiency range and uh, how humans are not supposed to be swimmers, and the efficiency range can be between three and ten percent. And so, uh, you know, a, a new okay average swimmer might be three percent, and Michael Phelps might be ten percent. So there's a, a range of improvement opportunities there. So that's one thing that I think is really important to understand is that getting better is not just about fitness, but the fitness that you need to sustain those efficiency improvements will follow if you're constantly rehearsing those more efficient patterns in the water, right? Right. right. So that's one really important thing. And then the second really important thing layers on top of that, and that's the idea that um, you know, once you reach your your initial goal, let's say you want to swim a, a sprint or an Olympic triathlon leg in 30 minutes, you know, and maybe you think, well, that's good enough. Now I can focus on other things. But if yeah. you want to continue improving, there's there's no limit really. You know, maybe you've improved your efficiency to four and a half or five percent, and you've maxed out your fitness at that efficiency level. Well, there's well, still even probably... even let's you know take that example you gave that someone has gotten to the 30 minute level. Mm -hmm. uh, in, that, in that swim, maybe it's 1.5k, I guess, is what you're referring to. And that could be yes. any number. It could be 24. Yeah, without going any faster, um, there's a lot you could work on there. Um, you know, which is, can I do it more easily? Can I navigate better? Can I reduce the emotional stress and the pressure that uh -huh. I feel? Can I be more comfortable in every way uh, without necessarily trying to go 29 minutes? Uh -huh. And then you do that, and then one day you come out of the water, and the clock says 29 minutes or 27 <laughs> minutes, even though you didn't try. Right, right. No, that's perfect. That's that's a great example. Um, so let's move on to some specific things about what to improve. So I think we've presented a good case that everyone can improve, and that it's a good goal to have. Um, and by doing so, are the the underlying goals that may seem more superficial, such as um, speed. Will will come more naturally. They just so, happen. What's that? I said they just happen then. They just happen. Yeah, it doesn't like this, voodoo. Yeah. Um, so as far as uh, solving problems in the water, there are multiple levels of problems there. You mentioned cognitive problems and neuromuscular problems. Um, can you describe for us briefly the basic sequence of problem solving that we use in total immersion when we're training new coaches and during our initial lesson series. We've got a pretty um, standard sequence, and I'm not speaking of the specific drill sequences that you might find in a certain edition of the book, but are just really fundamental approach to how we solve that problem. Yeah, it, you know, it's about creating a framework for viewing, viewing uh, swimming and the improvement process and knowing the starting point, and you know, so once you know that a human swimmer, of which we both and everybody watching this is, um, <laughs> is a, an energy wasting machine all right then you you have a real clear priority all right mm -hmm. which is to save energy um, and you know another phrase I like is that we are not only an energy wasting machine but the human brain is an absolutely awesome problem solving machine so you've got the tool <laughs> you know you've got the tool and it's not limbs lungs and muscles <laughs> it's it's designing your sets um, to make better use of your brain, knowing that the limbs, lungs, and muscles are still going to be doing doing their thing. So so solving the three percent problem or the energy wasting problem, it gives us a really clear problem solving focus. Um, and solving that problem is is really cognitive and neural in nature, mm -hmm. all right? You have to, by cognition, I mean just training yourself to be focused, training yourself to be more aware so that you notice things that have escaped your attention before. So that when you notice, you're able to, on the fly, analyze and sort through certain possibilities and think strategically about the possibilities for why I'm getting this signal, what it's telling me, mm -hmm. and what is my solution process for this. So. That's that's cognitive, developing the ability to think clearly, strategically, in a targeted way uh -huh. while while you're in swimming, or even just at the end of the pool to think, what am I going to do next? Yeah. Or before you go there, <laughs> you know, the decision making that we have, uh, rather than just go to the internet and download one more workout, 
mm-hmm. right, and just sort of follow that heedlessly. Yeah. But, but to do this, all this strategic thinking, so it's cognitive, all right. Uh, and the second level is that it's neural because you, you, the only way to solve an energy waste problem is to improve your skill, improve your efficiency, improve the way you do the big and little things uh, in swimming, and that really is. It's about changing the infrastructure of your brain, creating new uh, neural networks so that yeah. your hand goes in through mm-hmm. a mail slot instead of slams down on the surface and, you know, 60 other things uh-huh. uh, that can make a difference uh, in energy saving. So it's, you know, it's a cognitive and neural process, not a, not a muscular and aerobic process. And I think the other thing that we have to be aware of but also is incredibly healthy for us as mature individuals uh, because it's good it's good for the mature brain is that all of this stuff I'm talking about is a hundred percent counterintuitive right yeah. this way of thinking it goes against the grain it's not following conventional wisdom it's thinking outside the box mm-hmm. right so just the fact that you're thinking this way going against the grain um, really is is it's good for you to do that it's you know it's been proven by cognitive specialists that that's one of the healthiest things that we can turn up turn invert our preconceptions uh-huh. right about things and then secondly is that all the solutions that we teach are also counterintuitive so you have to be really mindful about applying them all right mm-hmm. so step one is identify the problem clearly step two is understand the process and the priorities you will have in solving that problem and then step three is the recipe <laughs> and you I'm know ta- the recipe why don't you share the recipe oh all right I'll share that I'm taking notes as we talk because uh, you know honestly every time we have a conversation um, you know you've thought of of a, a new way to, to to reframe things that we already know um, yeah. and it's just nice to have it's nice to have new recipes you know yeah. <laughs> um, let me bef- Let's get to the uh, the recipe shortly. Can I ask you one or two questions yeah, just to sure. fill in some blanks, things that came up as you were um, chatting? So um, a lot of directions we could go here. Can you give us some specific ways to notice things? Uh, and may- maybe that's a leading question. Uh, something that I'm thinking of is uh, at a certain level, let's say the 3% efficient swimmer, maybe all they notice when they're in the water is that swimming feels really hard, right? Yeah. Uh, I'll often ask uh, my swimmers on their first lesson to give me one word that describes their swimming. And by limiting it to one word, it's really, really enlightening. Because yeah. I, can, I can watch them swim, but the words that I get back are, tell me how, what they're feeling. It gives me an emotional yeah. state almost. And I get words like fighting or struggle yeah. or, you know, in some cases I, I get uh, relaxed. And maybe it's someone who's relaxed swimming, but they're not very efficient. Um, so for that type of person, what kinds of, of things might they um, develop an awareness of as far as like sinking or balance? Um, yeah. what, you know, what's the first step there? I think, I think there are two steps. One is to cultivate the habit of attention, all mm-hmm. right? Because I think very few people do that. I, I, I think most people just sort of count laps or they think about other things other than swimming. Their mind is just going elsewhere. Um, and I think partially it's, there's two reasons because they're not used to mindfulness. Mindfulness meaning to to choose something specific, something functional, and to keep your mind on that thing. So they're not used to mindfulness. Most of us are not. We're used to distraction. Uh, <clears throat> yeah. And I think that is more and more the case. Wait, let me check my phone. <laughs> <laughs> I think that is more and more the case today that, that we're we're programmed sort of for distractibility um, and and so swimming can be a really useful um, therapy for that in terms of using your 30, 45, 60 minutes to practice mindfulness. Mm-hmm. Right? So often in open water what I have people do as an exercise and this is something you can particularly do in open water is you're usually surrounded by uh, you know a beautiful environment and mm-hmm. I ask people for you know for five or ten minutes to just swim and when they take a breath to notice <laughs> what they're surrounded by. Yeah. Um, I was swimming in a really beautiful lake earlier and it was under the Shuangunk Ridge and and the ridge was was to to the west and that was my left as I was swimming in one direction and my right as I swam the other direction and I just made a made it a point 
to observe and enjoy the beauty of the ridge uh, yeah. as I took a breath on that particular side. Mm -hmm. um, at the same time, the, on another lap, what I noticed was, um, and this was for 10 consecutive minutes most of the time, what I was noticing was, did I feel my head was completely released, completely weightless? Mm -hmm. And did it feel different? Did that sense of release change when I took a breath? Uh -huh. um, so there's not ever a, a, a stroke I take where there's not something like that, that where I'm really paying specific, specific, specific attention to. So one is cultivating the habit of paying attention. Um, and in some way, that comes down to your set design. So you actually are designing sets that require your attention or you can't complete the set mm -hmm. successfully. Mm -hmm. um, and the other is having a menu of things that you're used to pay attention to that you that you do quite frequently. You know, we, we, we often <coughs> recommend to people that for one um, possibility they can do a body scan working mm -hmm. from front to back. So you notice something about your hands, and for a while you pay attention to examining your hands. Are your fingers relaxed? Are your fingers pointing down? Is your hand patient? Does it feel light? There's any number of things you could you could do there. Um, mm -hmm. Move back to your arms. Are your arms staying on wide tracks, or are mm -hmm. they sloped a little bit? Um, move back to your head, which I did, which is focusing, does it feel like it's hanging? Move back to your torso. Do you feel like your shoulders are barely rotating? Move back to your legs. Do you feel like you've got the toe flick? So yeah. there's a lot of different ways to do it. And, you know, on our videos and in our books and so on, we give countless focal points and menus of focal points and so on. So there's, there's not a lack of things to pay attention to. It's mainly about getting in the habit. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, I want to talk about uh, a tool that we use very uh, very frequently. Um, yes. Some some coaches, uh, some people that come to our coach training um, can't imagine swimming without it and so we need to find a good balance. I'm among them. <laughs> <laughs> um, and that's the uh, the Tempo Trainer, uh, tempo trainer by um, Finis or Finis. Um, it's for, for anyone who's not familiar with it, uh, you, you absolutely must look it up. Uh, I apologize, I don't have one sitting here right next to me to show you, but um, uh, the Tempo Trainer is um, something, it's basically a swim metronome. And the recipe that Terry's talking about, you know, sort of this recipe for improvement, um, we also refer to it as the math of speed. Uh, it's very simple. Your speed from one length of the pool to the other, the number of seconds it takes you to cross the pool, is equal to the number of strokes that you take multiplied by how many seconds each stroke takes. There's a little push-off in there as well. It's easier to get used to the concept at first by not worrying about the push-off and then we can add that in later. But um, you know, as an example, um, a, a sequence that a swimmer might go through as they're working on their way from a 3% efficient swimmer to a 4, 5, 6, 7% efficient swimmer. You know, it, in the beginning, if uh, you're not very fast, and if your your one word description of swimming to you is um, fighting, <laughs> and you feel like you're constantly sinking, and you don't have that additional awareness, uh, you know that attention cultivated that you mentioned, you know your stroke count's probably going to be very high. And it's just it's not that the stroke count number itself is good or bad, but it's an indication that there are a lot of opportunities for improvement that have nothing to do with your tempo or how fast you're going, but with just minimizing the effort it takes to get through the water. You know, put your, your stroke in the water and are you moving forward as you stroke? So it's very simple and we're not saying that um, that if you're six foot tall you need to take exactly 13 strokes or if you're five foot tall you need to get to 13, 14, 15 strokes. But the, the number of strokes you take is a first indicator of kind of your ease at moving through the water. Um, so, you know, that might be the first step in improving your swimming, um, and there's some specific strategies for that, but I really want to get to the, the meat of using the tempo trainer. So, um, you can set the tempo trainer to uh, any number of seconds in increments of one hundredth of a second. And on land, when you're pressing the little right button and you hear the, you know, 1.01 seconds, 1.02, 1.03, they all kind of sound the same when you're standing there but you put it in your cap and you get in the pool and suddenly it's a huge difference. Um, 
can talk about uh, you know maybe some of your first experiences with the tempo trainer and how you began um, implementing it into more of your TI training. Um, the first time I ever used one was uh, in the summer of 2004. I can remember it specifically and vividly the first practice that I that I ever uh, used it. Um, and uh, you know, going back, back, I had been doing training with focal points, so I had practiced mindfulness uh, for about 15 years, starting in 1989 when I started to remake my stroke into a, a TI stroke, mm -hmm. uh, starting in '89. So I'd practiced mindfulness and focal point practice since that time. So I had 15 years of mindfulness practice. Um, <laughs> and what I noticed when I put the tempo trainer on is that beep had the effect of banishing stray thoughts that, that formerly would sort of come into my head. You know, the, what the Z, uh, Buddhist monks call the monkey mind. Even though I was very <laughs> practiced at mindful swimming, I still would have these stray thoughts, you know, might be a swimming thought, it might be another part of my body that I wasn't choosing to pay attention to mm -hmm. at that time or noticing a little error or something and being distracted by that. When I put on the tempo trainer, the effect, the first effect of the beep was I found it quieted my mind. Even though that beep was there, so there was obviously a noise, yeah. but it, it had the surprising effect of quieting my mind and making me better at the focus I chose. Interesting. And interestingly enough, um, I put it on some 10, 11, and 12-year-old boys, probably the, a, a summer or two later, um, and they were the type who you would give them a you would give them a set, you would give them a specific instruction, and they'd start swimming down the pool. And for 10, 10 yards or meters, it would look like they were paying attention and doing what you asked, and then it was apparent they were no longer paying attention. <laughs> and the first time I put it on these 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 boys, all of whom as most boys that do that age had something like ADD. Uh, they swam 800 continuous meters with what looked to me like purposeful strokes. I had wow. never seen anything like it. It was <laughs> miraculous. <laughs> Their parents so that was the first thing. But the, then the next thing was was um, the math of speed. Um, and uh, I, I, guess, I guess the thing that has the big takeaway for me for, for the tempo trainer is until I used it, and, and probably like most people do, I would push off one end of the pool, and I was swimming in a 50 meter pool, so it's a long way to the other end, a lot of strokes, and, a, and a quite a bit of time to get there. Um, and I would push off one end of the pool, and I would just be thinking about getting to the other end. Mm -hmm. And then I'd put it's the tempo trainer way. on, and if I set the tempo at 1.2 seconds per stroke, that lap became transformed into a series of 1.2 second intervals. Mm -hmm. And quite often what I'd be doing at, say, 1.2 seconds is, let's say, trying to maintain a stroke count of 38 strokes across 50 meters at 1.2 seconds, for instance. All right? and, and I would be repeating. And as you said, you, you mentioned a little while ago that you can really distinguish the difference after practice between 1.20 seconds and 1.22 seconds, oh. <laughs> you, can, you can distinguish the change in, in time in between beeps. All right. Well, the mm -hmm. other thing you get really good at, and I think the tempo trainer's beep aids this, is that you recognize the feel of a 38-stroke uh, lap. Every stroke in a 38-stroke lap has a feel, all right? Yeah. And if you're going to take 39 strokes or 40 strokes, all right, you recognize in the moment it happens, as you're, you're in mid-pool, and something, some tiny little thing that you <laughs> never would notice otherwise changes in mid-pool, and the first thought that comes into your head is, that's going to mean 39 strokes, not 38. <laughs> and then the second thought that comes in is, oh, and that extra stroke has a cost. I'm going to be 1.2 seconds slower when I get yeah. there. So, so you start with the idea of a lap now as a, period, a, a series of 1.2 second intervals, and then you have within each of those intervals, you have what I call consequential nanoseconds, uh -huh. where you do things right, you do things right, you do things right, and one stroke, it's not quite right, and you know it as soon as it happens. That's uh -huh. the consequential nanosecond. Yeah, you know, that's so that, that is that is as deep as you can get 
into being process oriented, not outcome oriented, when you're at that level of self awareness. Yeah. And I, I had never experienced anything like it until I started training with the Temple Trainer, and now it's become routine. Even when I don't have it on. Yeah. It, ha it has its imprint. Yeah. I, um, I don't know if he's tuned in, but there's a, a friend of mine named Eric, and um, he and I were talking about the Tempo Trainer use. We were just doing Facebook messages back and forth, and I just described him a simple way to begin using it. And um, he didn't want to go out and purchase one just yet, but the next time he went to the pool, he thought about having a beep in his head. <laughs> beep. Beep. Beef. And he said he swam, you know, fewer strokes and faster times with more relaxation than he ever had. You know why? It's a form of visualization, and it helped mm -hmm. him. It helped him stay calmly focused. I think. Yeah, I think that was it. It gave him something to think about. You mentioned that we're right. so wired for distraction. Um, it, it gives you something to really help focus. Yeah. Um, so, do you think uh, everybody tuning in do they need to have 15 years of mindfulness practice before they can start using their tempo trainer? Now, now you can vastly accelerate that process. If you know, <laughs> if I had understood what it would do for me, I would have started much, much sooner. Yeah, uh, I try to start uh, my swimmer is not necessarily as soon as possible, but but I try to introduce it early so they can get the experience of listening to it. And yeah. uh, I don't want anyone listening to think that they have to be the uh, the tempo trainer ninja. Um, like you are when they use it, but there's a lot of ways to use it that are uh, much more easier to access and appropriate for every level. We use it in our weekend workshops on, you know, the afternoon of day one, and it can work great. Yeah. Well, you know, I would one bit of uh, advice I would give people who are about to start using it is is don't worry about numbers at first. Um, use its capacity to strengthen your focus. And one of the things I encourage people to do. Is, is do a lap or a few laps where you focus just on sinking to your hands mm -hmm. and see what you notice about your hands that you didn't notice because of the aid of, of the tempo trainer. Yeah. Then do a series of laps where you focus on sinking to your hips, the movement of your hips. Yeah. Then do a series where you so focus on the feeling of, of your feet and sinking. Yeah. Because when I sink, now the person watching on deck can't tell whether I'm sinking to my hands, hips, or feet. When, the stroke never changes. Let me in but interrupt my you. Just awareness, for a second. Yeah, my awareness of the stroke changes. You're, when you say sinking, I just want to clarify: not sinking in the water. You're just synchronizing. Synchronizing. Yes. S Y N C H I N G. Yeah. All right. Fantastic. Um, let's go ahead and start taking some questions. Um, we've got. I don't know, until we get bored, I guess. <laughs> but we're going to, uh, this has been great, Terry. Thank you very much. I've got a whole oh, page full of notes. I love it, Suzanne. Notes. Let's do it again. Okay, sounds great. I hope everybody comes back and invite your friends. Um, and if you're intrigued with the Tempo Trainer ideas, um, again, stay tuned because there will be some special offers from uh, Finis, the company that produces and sells the Tempo Trainer as well as Endurance Films. Um, so our first question is from Jennifer in Portland, Oregon. And here's her question. What are your recommendation? What is your recommendation for sighting in open water swimming without making your legs sink? I'm a pool swimmer just learning sighting. All right. So what I do is I make sure that uh, two things. Um, one is I take a snapshot, not a long look, and I can take several snapshots if it's if it's not clear right away. Mm -hmm. um, and and so that's number one. Uh, when you're going to take a snapshot or a, a really quick, brief look, you kind of want to, for, you know, for, uh, in your head, visualize what you're going to see, um, what you're looking for, and and what it means before you look up. You know, so mostly what I'm looking for, I'm usually at 62, not in the lead. Um, so usually I have the luxury of following other people in an open water swim. Mm -hmm. So I'm just kind of looking to see where the caps are. You know, with the distribution of caps, um, if the distribution of caps, uh, the cluster of caps is off to my right, I know I'm going left, for instance. You know, and, and so I don't, it doesn't take me long to figure that out. Um, so that's one, is, is take snapshots, not long looks. Um, number two uh, is that I only surf my goggles. My nose does not come out of the water. Uh, I don't breathe and sight at the same time. I have a way of falling into a into a breath that's right in time with my stroke, which is a skill I've developed over time. But mm -hmm. uh, but I don't breathe while sighting. 
Okay, thanks. So you're separating the sighting skill from the breathing skill, and they may or may not be coordinated. Is that correct? Right. Well, I coordinate them. It's a, it's a skill, and you know, it's a skill we teach in our open water camps and in the open water video uh, that we sell. Okay, great. Um, next question is from uh, Mary Lou. Uh, Hi, Terry and Suzanne. Love the TI approach to swimming. It's been a great help. How important is tempo in TI swimming? I find my strokes are coordinated with my need to breathe, should my breathing be coordinated with proper timing of my stroke? So that's a perfect uh, lead-in from your last comment. Yeah, well you can't really separate breathing from stroking. Um, so your stroking rhythm, your breathing rhythm, and your tempo are all going to be the same. Uh, one really interesting thing that I did a lot of very early uh, was I would, I would sync, sync the tempo to a lap of left side breaths, uh, to a lap of right side breaths, Mm -hmm. to a lap of bilateral breaths, uh, to, to bilateral breaths of different frequency, breathe two right, two left, three right, three left, four right, four left, and so on. I would examine every possible iteration of my breathing <laughs> and make sure that there was never any variation in my tempo. So uh -huh. um, also just slowing the tempo and speeding the tempo uh, and seeing what sort of adjustments you need to make in your stroke. You know, I can still I, I may slow the tempo to as slow as a stroke every 1.8 seconds, which is super, super slow. And I've done it as fast as a stroke every 0.85 seconds, almost a difference uh, of a full second. And, mm -hmm. you know, I'm trying to feel unhurried, lazy, um, <laughs> like I've got all the time in the world uh, to take my breath, even as the tempo is getting down to those pretty brisk tempos faster than 1.0. Uh, seconds per stroke. Yeah, and um, just to, an additional comment from Mary Lou, I find one of the things that helps people kind of break through from uh, struggling to increase their tempo and still breathe well is that there's a, a sweet spot where if you're moving efficiently through the water, you're going to create a bow wave in front of your head. And if your breathing technique is good, in other words, if your head remains aligned, that bow wave will push a wave of water in front of you, and there will be a space to breathe into, which makes breathing easier. But if your breathing technique is, is not good, if you're lifting your head up to breathe, you're going to put your face right into that wave, and so you won't be able to breathe well at any tempo. So uh, two, two different components to breathing. So it's definitely um, a, a key part to work on, and definitely I encourage you to work on increasing your tempo with your breathing. And if you can do it, use a tempo trainer to work on that, that's ideal. Um, next question. Um, Philip from uh, UC Berkeley. My legs inevitably sink when I back float or backstroke. Pushing down on various areas of head and upper body do not help. I'm not able to find buoyancy when someone has supported my body and lets go. Suggestions? Well, Philip, I'm going to be out in Berkeley in March and April, and if you're still struggling with it, maybe we can get together. I'll, I'll probably be in Berkeley for a month or six weeks or so uh, in, in March and April. Um, but I think that the starting point for, um, for feeling supported, um, for having a good balanced body position, the starting point is always head position. And so what we, what we are looking for as coaches is how much of the head is visible above the water. Uh, we want to see just a very small area when, when we're teaching someone uh, position for freestyle and breaststroke and the other strokes that you swim on the breast. Um, we want to see just a very small circle of the back of the cap above the surface. And at the same time, we'd like to see little wavelets pass over that, um, that little bit of cap. All right, We neither want to see the head exposed all the time, nor do we want to see the head submerged all the time. All right, We want to see that little circle that disappears with each stroke momentarily. Turn it over on backstroke and the equivalent for that is that all that should be visible above the water is your face. All right? So you should think about the surface of the water forming a circle that wraps around the corners of your goggles and right down to your chin. Um, so, so everything else outside of that circle should be below the surface. Mm -hmm. And taking the idea that a wavelet should pass over your face, it's okay and probably desirable for a wavelet to pass over your face as, you know, as your hand goes in the water. 
you just don't breathe at that <laughs> moment that it does. In fact, I'll say this, uh, Lenny Kraselberg, uh, who was uh, probably, I think he, he won four Olympic gold medals, if not more. Uh, he was the best backstroker in the world about 10 years ago. Um, he, he kind of made it a point that if he was not getting wavelets going over his face as he swam backstroke, then he knew his, his head was too high. Mm, fascinating. So I, I look for the same thing when I swim backstroke. Great. And um, Phil, I'll just add one more thing that um, a lot of people do experience sinking, but when you can balance the body so that you're sinking evenly, in other words, head, chest, and hips are sinking equally as fast as the legs, then you've achieved balance even though you may be a little bit under the surface of the water. So some people may struggle with that part of, uh, of finding balance, and it may not always be initially about trying to stay on top of the water. And while, uh, you want, while you want the bulk of your head below the water, you want to make sure each shoulder clears on its stroke. So you want to feel that your right shoulder is clear as the right arm is coming over in recovery and mm -hmm. vice versa. Thanks. Um, Debbie, I wanted to know about tapering. My arms feel a bit tired after two-mile swims in consecutive days. I have an aquathon today at 6 p.m. and an Olympic try on Saturday morning. I'm worried about doing the race today to be ready for Saturday and be at my best. Yeah, I would be too. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, racing two days in a row, you're gonna you're gonna feel the effects on the second day of the of the first day's race. It's a given, you know. And I do that a lot. I mean, I I don't try to rest or taper for every race. I I will generally choose one race a season that I want to really do my best at. And I don't mind swimming a little bit tired in the others, um, just because I'm not, you know, I'm not going to evaluate those races as if I was tapered or at my best or, or feeling my best. Um, and so what I'm looking for in races where I have not rested and maybe during that week I, I've been working a little bit harder is, is I'm looking to still feel that I can execute the race well, that I have to be a little more attentive to swimming really efficiently, to staying relaxed, to, to swimming a really even intelligent pace and, and, and so on. You know, mm -hmm. So it's, it's just a different problem solving exercise uh, when you're racing on a day that you are not rested. How about you Suzanne, how do you do that? Well I, you brought up a great point, um, you know the idea of tapering in order to be, perform at your best and then having two races back to back, whether it's one day apart or two days separated, uh, you need to have appropriate expectations for those right. days. So, you know, when you go into a race, every race is not just about swimming your fastest. Um, being at your best may be my, my best um, emotional execution of the race or my best, um, you know, uh, warm up for the race. There may be different components of my race day strategy that I'm practicing and the race itself is a practice. Uh, you know, in traditional um, triathlon coaching or, you know, any uh, sport really where you've got a series of uh, competitions throughout the season, we talk about having an A race, a B race, a C race. And one component of having an A race is being physically at your best where you can perform your fastest, right? The fastest time from point A to point B. But as we talked about before, in, uh, in swimming, so much of, of your ultimate speed has to do with your efficiency, how much energy am I using to get to point A to point B. When my um, emotions get caught up or if I get physically fatigued, my um, first thing that goes when I get fatigued is my breathing gets off. And that creates this sort of internal panic or this internal anxiety that things aren't going well. And then my stroke further deteriorates. And so that's a, a specific skill that has absolutely nothing to do with my physical conditioning and everything to do with developing awareness in a race or competitive setting. So you talked about um, awareness in the pool and developing that mindfulness and a lot of different strategies for that. You know, when you're in a race, you can also approach it from the perspective, can I maintain uh, mindfulness from uh, the start of the race to the finish of the race? Or is there a part of the race where I know that traditionally I tend to fall apart? You know, for a lot of people that's about two-thirds of the way through, you know, whether it's each leg of a triathlon or from the finish of the race, that, that last little bit before you can start to envision the finish line tends to be uh, the emotional low point, like, oh, I'm tired. How much longer is this going to last? Can I make it? When can I speed up? Have I used up all my energy? What if something bad happens? 
Uh, and so managing those, the emotional and the uh, attentiveness is another really good thing that you can take into each race and really benefit from and feel like you're getting, a, uh, you know, being at your best for the race. You may not be physically at your best, but you can be at your best by working on those other strategies as well. Let's and uh, I guess, you know, I would just add one more thought on the tapering thing, which is that, uh, you know, just gentle swimming, really, really gentle swimming. We are trying to feel absolutely awesome, the best you can be, uh, silky magic, as Suzanne sometimes <laughs> refers to it. Um, mm -hmm. That can be really restorative. It, it I think, can, can put some, put some, you know, physical snap back into your swimming uh, pretty quickly, but it just puts you in a great state of mind, and there's nothing better than going into a race in a great state of mind. Okay, next question is from Janet Jarvitz. When the water temperature is not an issue for the swim leg of a triathlon, when should you choose to wear a wetsuit? That's a question for you. I don't own one. <laughs> uh, I own one, but I haven't worn it for several years. Uh, Janet, I think that's a real personal thing that has to do with um, your, your body type, um, how much body fat you have. Um, how fast you swim, and I'm not saying how fast you swim from the perspective of only fast people should wear them or only slow people should wear them, but um, if you're swimming in cold water and you're not using a lot of effort, let's compare it to a, a power meter on a bike because I think a lot of triathletes can relate to that, um, and if you can, I apologize, but uh, just a real simple analogy here. On a bicycle, your efficiency conversion is about 25%. So when I'm riding my bike, say my power meter is reading 200 watts, um, which is pretty high for me. Uh, but that represents about 25% of my energy is going into creating 200 watts of, of output to move the bike forward, um, which means that I've got an extra 600 watts, right? That's the other 75% that's going into body heat generation. All right, so when I look at a power meter on the bike, I can see exactly how many watts are going into... Um, producing energy uh, and how many watts are going into into body heat creation. Uh, and if you're a professional tour, tour rider and you're putting out 400 watts or 600 watts, your body heat generation is that many, many times higher as well. So those pros that you see in the Tour de France riding in the, uh, in the Alps uh, or the Pyrenees in short sleeve shirts when it's um, you know 30 degrees out and it's snowing at the summit, they're generating a ton of body heat, way more body heat than I would generate because I'm simply not producing as much power. So take that into swimming, you know, cold water swimming. If you're a relatively slower swimmer, okay, and if you've got a small body mass, you don't don't have a lot of muscle to create um, body heat. Everybody's going to be creating excess body heat because swim efficiency is so low, you know, the, the 3 to 10 percent ratio. So 90 to 95 percent of your energy is going towards creating body heat. So the faster you swim, the more body heat you're creating, so the less likely you'll need a wetsuit. Um, so that, that's one aspect of it, and you're only going to figure that out by experimenting in different cold water settings. Um, obviously, the less body fat that you have, the less insulation you have. So uh, do you typically see open water swimmers, you know, English Channel swimmers, where they don't wear wetsuits, tend to be a little on the uh, the um, beefy. Zoftig. What's that? Zoftig. <laughs> oh, yeah. They, they tend to have a little more body fat, and they allow themselves to gain weight um, deliberately, and that's for heat insulation. So it really depends on, on your personal desires. And some people just don't like the cold water touching their skin. So I uh, can't give you a good answer on that. Um, you're going to need to go in uh, on your own and figure out which of those elements apply to you. Uh, do you have a low body fat percentage? Um, do you tend to, to ride lower in the water? Um, do you not swim very fast? You're not creating a lot of body heat. So what, do you, what benefit do you get from the wetsuit? And what are you hoping to gain by wearing it versus not wearing it? All right. Um, Jesse Gay from Reed College. Can you talk about the adjustments to the TMS? Alma mater of Steve Jobs. Is, did he go to Reed College? I don't know if he had graduated, but he went there. <laughs> okay. Um, Jesse wants to know, can you talk about the adjustments to the TI freestyle that tend to be made for different body types? For example, it seems like coaches Gaddy, Terry, and Shinji each have their own variations on TI swimming. I'm fairly tall and thin, and I have varying results depending on whose style I try to emulate. That's a terrific question. I, you know, I've been asked many times about why, why my entry and extension angle is shallower than Shinji's. Um, and 
you know, I when I explain to people the, the difference I give is is that we do have very different body types. Uh, Shinji, relative to me, has a very long spine and relatively short legs, which means he is much better balanced in general. Um, and but I don't think that's the primary reason. It's just that Shinji is more grace oriented, and I'm more speed oriented as someone who races a lot. And so my my stroke is you know my stroke is um, I guess I stroke more aggressively than, than Shinji a lot of the time because I'm swimming for speed. So I'm reaching out more, I'm trying to get the catch sooner, uh, and so on. Um, and it's not, I'm not even explicitly and consciously thinking those things. I'm stroking in a way that generates more speed. Um, but generally, the, the advice we give people if they are um, if they struggle a bit with balance is that their entry angle and extension should be a little steeper, a little more sloped. Um, if your balance feels really great, if you feel really supported, if your kick is really easy, then you have the freedom to reach a little further forward. Not that we ever want you to be horizontal, have the arm be horizontal on its extension. Uh, there should always be some slope in the arm. <coughs> but you know, the best thing is just to experiment a little bit. I, I don't think there's ever going to be a really, really big change uh, in most people's strokes. Mm -hmm. Thanks. I, uh, there's a great picture that I have on my screensaver <coughs> of myself and uh, our TI coach, Kati Franco, who's from uh, uh, Merida, Mexico. Yucatan. Uh, Yucatan, yeah, near, um, near Cancun. And uh, Kati and I are about the same height. I'm five foot three. She might be five foot two and three quarters. Uh, you know, typical female body fat distribution. And we both have very short to torsos with long arms for our height. Now my arms are short, but compared to how tall I am, they're about two inches longer than my height. And um, Kati and I both have almost identical underwater swim profiles without consulting with each other. And I was shocked when I, wa when I saw underwater video. And it's like you mentioned, my entry is much more horizontal and flat than other people um, because I can I can get away with a, a shallower arm entry yeah. um, because my balance is a little bit better. I have a little bit no, more natural buoyancy in the back end. Um, yeah, the fact that your wingspan is greater than your height usually goes along with good balance. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let's see. When learning TI, this is from uh, Don uh, Nowak or Don Novak. Um, when learning TI, should I avoid full stroke swimming, or is it okay to spend part of my time doing drills and part swimming laps? What do you think, Suzanne? Well, I think that's a great question, and yeah. it's, it's very individual. Um, everybody learns differently, and I think that if you are doing drills and you are continuing to see improvement in the drills and you're enjoying it, it's fine to continue doing them. Um, if you've got a race coming up in two weeks, if you've registered for a half Ironman, and you're still doing drills and you're on lesson three and you haven't moved past it, well, then you should uh, accept what your stroke is right now and start doing full stroke to, to get ready for your race. Now, I'm not saying that you need to give up everything, but uh, the, the point is that everyone um, is going to get different things from, let's say, the, uh, the 10 lesson series, the Perpetual Motion Freestyle DVD. A lot of people will start with lesson one. Um, work on that for a week or two, move to lesson two, move to lesson three, and they'll be very resistant to moving past um, the lesson until they master it. And the truth is that for exactly the reason we just discussed, people have different body types. Um, they're going to have different successes in accomplishing certain things. So for example, um, lesson two, I believe, in that series is core balance, uh, which we don't always do in private lessons or workshops, but core balance is with your arms at your sides, leaning with your head and gently working on, on torso rotation. can't really see me on the camera here. Torso rotation in the pool. Now, if you um, have flotation in the back end, all right, and uh, short torso, that's going to be a fairly easy drill. If you've got really lean um, legs, a lot of muscle mass in the legs and low body fat, that's going to be a very difficult drill. There's no reason you can't move right past that and move on to the next thing because as you start to incorporate additional pieces of the full stroke, it's going to feel easier and easier. So that's one thing. You don't have to do the drills in order. The other thing is that we've really gotten away from um, doing all drills and then stroking at the end um, because most people are able to integrate. You know, if I give you one tip about head position, you can immediately take that tip into your full stroke freestyle and feel an instant difference in how you swim. 
Um, you don't have to master 10 different components before making an improvement in whole stroke. And it tends to be a little bit more enjoyable. It helps people feel a little bit less stuck if they can do, um, for example, 10 to 15 minutes of drilling, you know, depending on your, your, your skill level. And no matter whether or not you feel like you've mastered the drill, if the drill has helped you increase awareness, like we talked about before, then try taking that awareness into four to six strokes without taking a breath because the breathing is going to be another distraction, right? So you developed an awareness from the drill. Let's just say head position, for example. Um, start with the drill and then take four to six strokes. Are you still able to maintain awareness of what your head is doing with or without trying to correct it? Um, once you've developed a new awareness of your head position while stroking, now try throwing in a breath. What happens to your awareness now and what happens to your head position now? And can you regain that awareness after stroking? Um, so we're getting more and more away from drill, 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 drill swim, uh, and doing more drill, swim, drill, swim, drill, swim. But every individual is going to be different. Do you have anything to add to that, Terry? Um, yeah, I would have said it pretty much the same when I when I teach a lesson. When pretty much all of our co coaches teach lessons, when we teach workshops, and what we advocate on uh, the perpetual motion freestyle DVD is is essentially if you're going to be doing, say, Superman glide. You might do four to six reps of Superman Glide, and those reps are going to last eight seconds each. Uh, and then you'll do f a similar number of reps of Superman Glide plus three to four strokes. Um, and those would all be with a focus on hanging your head, for instance. Mm -hmm. And then you might try um, adding a few breaths to it and see what happens to your sense of weightless head when you do that. So that's pretty much the way we advocate practicing now. Great. Um, okay, next question. And uh, just so folks listening in know, we've got about 25 more minutes of questions and then we'll wrap things up here. Um, Dan Vito wants to know, can you talk a bit more about the role of kicking in the TI approach? Oh, I love that question. Uh, <laughs> I think going back to the <coughs> question we just answered, um, you know, we made this change mm -hmm. in how we teach drills to, as you said, drill, swim, drill, swim, drill, swim, trying to integrate right away the sensation that was heightened in the drill and see how it feels in, in the stroke. Another really significant change we made was to do much shorter repetitions of drills, um, where we might formally have done, say, uh, 25 yards of skate on the right and then 25 yards of skate on the left and do that a number of times. What we're far more likely to do now is have somebody do Superman glide, skate for just a few moments, stand up, do Superman glide, skate for a few moments on the other side and repeat that a whole bunch of times just going back and forth in a shallow, in a shallow section of the pool. Now why did we do that? Well the main reason was that we were seeing that after the first eight yards or so for a lot of people the, uh, the next, you know, uh, 18 yards, 17 yards, was turning into an exercise in kicking with a main goal of getting to the other end of the pool. So what we, you know, what we're telling people now is really take care to not have a drill that is about rotating your shoulder a little bit, having your hand sloped a little bit, having your head aligned, and so on. Uh, having your whole body aligned, not to have that turn into an exercise that's primarily a kicking exercise. Mm -hmm. um, because what that does is it leaves an imprint of busy, busy legs. And what we, you know, the default thing we're aiming for now is for anyone whose goals are to swim for fitness, to swim longer distances, to swim in open water, all of those goals, the default uh, choice that we advocate is the to be kick. And, and the to be kick is really about learning to move the legs um, in rhythm and in tune with the body rotation, which is completely different from the nonstop kicking that propels you down the pool in state. <clears throat> so we're just trying to get away from anything that would leave an imprint of something you later have to undo. Mm -hmm. um, and and so yeah, we I I have not done a kicking set of on a kickboard in in over 20 years. I haven't even done kicking, quote unquote, on my side, like a full length of skating with nonstop kick. I haven't done that in many years either. 
I think it's uh, been about three years because I think I was with you the last time you did it. <laughs> yeah, and I probably was just doing it to, sh to show something, but yeah. I haven't done that in a long time. Um, I, I want the kick I practice to be the kick I use in whole stroke, and for me that's going to be a two-beat kick, and I don't bother practicing a steady flutter because I don't use it in whole stroke. Okay, just to play devil's advocate a little bit, so there's a difference between a steady flutter, which is somewhat disintegrated from the body rotation, and then a six-beat versus a two-beat kick. Where does the six-beat kick fall in? If I was okay. coaching someone to swim the 100 meters, I, w I would, uh, um, in almost all circumstances, I would be coaching them to integrate a smooth, um, well, seamlessly integrated six-beat that blended with everything into the stroke. I, I coached the sprinters at West Point from 96 to 99, and all of them were practicing six-beat kicking. Mm -hmm. um, so, but if it was if it was all the other things I mentioned, uh, you know, swimming in triathlon, swimming for fitness, um, uh, swimming longer distances, swimming in open water, for me, the best choice unquestionably is the two beat kick. Okay, let's move on. This question is from Wayne Souter from London, United Kingdom. Hey, Wait. good to see you or talk to you in some <laughs> way, Wayne. It's Wayne nice. swam like across the North Channel, the Irish Sea. One of very few people to do that. Yep, and he's up at 2 a.m. listening to us. Um, hi, Terry. I hope you're well. I'm struggling to get my stroke rate down from currently 18 strokes per 25 meters. I think it is mainly my lack of gliding. I am struggling to know how long to glide with each hand entry. Any suggestions? Yeah, don't glide. Push the right button on your tempo trainer. Keep pushing it. <laughs> the stroke count goes down. It will go down, no question about it. So um, I, th his question is, he mentioned stroke rate, but then he also talks about 18 strokes. So does it seem to be that he's taking 18 strokes at a certain rate and he wants to quicken the rate and still take 18 strokes? Is that how you're interpreting it? Well, the first that? thing I'd say is, you know, having met you, Wayne, and, and having an idea of your height and wingspan and so on, um, 18 is not necessarily that high a count. Um, I think if you had in a range, in a range of uh, maybe 16 to 19 strokes, um, that would be a, in a 25 meter pool. Um, maybe even 17 to 19 strokes. Um, I, I swam in a 25 meter pool yesterday. It was the only time all summer. All my other pool swimming had been in a 50 meter pool. Um, and um, I took I took 18 strokes on the last lap of most repeats. Um, I swam the whole practice in a range between 15 and 18 strokes, um, and uh, I'm uh, six feet tall. I don't know what that converts. I think it's 1.82 meters, maybe. Um, Sounds close. So yeah, 182 centimeters, I think. Um, and so, so that was my stroke count range, 15 to 18. So 18 is not necessarily high, but uh, every time I, I, I well, I'll, I'll give you an example. My ver very first set yesterday, um, I started with the tempo trainer set at 1.1, and I swam 50s. And my first 50 was 16 strokes down and 19 strokes back. No, 17 strokes down and 19 strokes back. So it was 36 strokes for, for 50 meters. I was with the tempo trainer set at 1.1. Then I slowed the tempo by 0.04. I went to 1.14. I took off a couple of strokes. I went to 1.18. I took off a couple of more strokes. I went to 1.22. So I was slowing the tempo by, mm -hmm. by a delta of 0 0.04 uh, on each 50. Uh, when I got to 1.22 on my fifth 50, I was at 31 strokes. Right, 15 down and 16 back. All I did, I didn't concentrate on gliding. I didn't concentrate on reaching. All I did was use the extra time between beeps optimally, and it saved me five strokes for 50 meters. Uh, then what I did was I brought the tempo back to my starting point of 1.1 by smaller increments. So I came back by a 0.02 increment. So I went 1.10, 1.14, 1.18, 1.22. When I got to 1.12, I thought I could shave one more stroke. So I did another one, and I did shave another stroke. All right, then I started coming back, but I went 1.20, 1.18, 1.16, and so on, trying as best I could to hold the sense of leisure in my stroke. 
to hold the sense of a patient catch, to hold the sense of a very stable catch, and so on. Very smooth and everything. The, all those great feelings that I cultivated as the tempo slowed. Um, when I got back down to 1.10, where I had been taking 36 strokes for 50 meters, before that I was taking 35. So I saved two strokes off my 1.10 tempo just by slowing a bit and then returning to where I started. So the, the tempo trainer really does have that magical quality of just um, automatically be making you more efficient. Yeah, that set that Terry just described we, is we call the asymmetric tempo pyramid. And um, uh, Wayne, you can find lots of uh, suggestions on the um, favorite sets and practices forum on the TI website, and I'm sure that Terry will be happy to consult with you in person as well. <laughs> there are probably several dozen examples on that on that conference in different threads uh, mm -hmm. of of a asymmetric tempo pyramid sets. All right, thanks, That's Wayne. Favorite practices and sets conference on the TI discussion forum. Uh, next question is from Paulo Mendez. Terry, do you recommend the use of endless pools for training? Do they provide a better environment for training than the regular lap pool? Yes, I, you know, I've, I've been swimming regularly in an endless pool for 10 or 11 years now, and it has, um, you know, I'm, I'm improvement minded. That's what this whole <laughs> webinar is about, and I, I could say without, you know, w with, with no reservation whatsoever that my, my, my improvement um, curve has, has really accelerated um, during the periods when I was swimming in a concentrated way in the endless pool. However, uh, the one thing is I don't do any training in the endless pool. All the time I do in the endless pool is what I call stroke tuning, which is Again, it's about improvement, uh, and one of the um, the real principles of improvement is that the people who are improvement-minded, one of the characteristics they have, the people who don't get stuck on the OK plateau, uh, they all share the characteristic of being error-focused. They're constantly looking for little, often very subtle, after you've been at it for many years, subtle errors in in their uh, in their form. Uh, and, and trying to find a way to improve it. So that's what I do in the endless pool is I'm really looking for little errors in the stroke and the mirrors and the current um, tremendously heighten my ability to be aware of those errors. So yeah, I'm always in there looking to tune up my stroke and fix little errors, find errors, fix them and so on. I do my training in a regular pool. Great, thanks. Um, while we're waiting for a next question, I wanted to ask you uh, another question that came up earlier that I had for you. Um, you had mentioned the idea of chunking. Um, yeah. that, uh, that's a word that, that you and I and uh, TI coaches use casually, but um, could you describe what that is just very briefly? Yes. Um, uh, a really good example of chunking, for instance, would be when we're teaching the recovery and the entry and the extension. Uh, we teach that via a series of uh, via a series of focal points. All right. So um, let's say that we started with the focus on a marionette arm or a ragdoll arm on recovery. All right. That's one focal point. You might practice that for six fifties, um, and then you would advance to the ear hop. The idea that your fingers are just going to briefly hop over your ear and drop right right into the water and you might practice that for five or six fifties then you have the male slot so your hand is going to cut a slot in the water you're going to slip your forearm uh, through that slot so that's three different focal points all right and if you practice each of those focal points for eight twenty fives or five fifties or something like that that's called block practice um, where for a period of seven eight minutes you're only practicing one focal point. Um, and then at some point af later than that, once you've had a chance to process and familiarize with and slightly imprint each of those individual focal points that you might try putting two of them together. All right? So you might do a couple of 25s or 50s where you put together the, uh, the ragdoll arm and the, and the ear hop or a couple where you put together the ear hop and the mail slot, or you might go way out on a limb 
and put together all three. All right, um, and that's called that's called chunking. When you when you take several, that's one example of chunking. But but when you take several different points of focus and you you combine them, and it is recommended that you practice them individually while you're familiarizing that with them, and then as you become familiar, that you begin um, chunking. Now, Suzanne, why does one want to chunk? What's the benefit or advantage? <laughs> Well, when you start chunking, you're able to take two or three sensations and turn them into one sensation. That right. sort of ha starts to happen seamlessly. Right. Um, and then that one sensation becomes a new focal point. So there may be yeah. a certain sensation I get when I when my kick is timed with my rotation at a specific rate when my breathing feels effortless. Yeah. And that, that's a really beautiful silky sensation that I have. And so to re to achieve that, I've practiced many, many different combinations um, and over the past three years it's sort of built up into the, the beautiful swimming, I, uh, beautiful breathing I experienced right. last night at my masters. So now that's one thing I can practice and now I can begin layering things, uh, other things on top of that as well. So can I get right. that so beautiful you, breath? You're, you're, freeing, you're freeing up space it, in, working, exactly. in working memory. Yep, I'm shifting. And, and that, yeah, that, that idea of of improvement, we're talking again about improvement, and one of the keys to improvement is that you're always doing what Suzanne referred to as layering, right? So you establish a skill, or maybe you you establish a chunk skill, and by having th things that you ha used to have to think about as three discrete thoughts have become one thought, right? Yep. Now you have space in your working memory to add another thought. So that layering process is a critical behavior and habit of people who improve. But the other the other benefit is that how do you move things from working memory to long term memory? Mm -hmm. And what you're really talking about, working memory occurs in the cerebral cortex, and long term memory, those those um, muscle memories are residing in the cerebellum, all right? And the cerebellum, a different part of the brain. You're actually moving the processing from from one part of the brain to the other part of the brain. And the great thing about the cerebellum is that's where you store things like brushing your teeth, tying your shoes, <laughs> tying a tie, signing your name, all these things that you do routinely. You don't want to waste a lot of processing power on them. You're actually using less energy in the yeah. cerebellum. Um, so it saves energy. Um, it accelerates the transfer of things from conscious control or what we call conscious competence uh, to yeah. autonomic control or unconscious competence where you're not thinking about it and your body still knows what to do. So mm -hmm. that chunking process is, is tremendously valuable. All right, we've got a, uh, less than 10 minutes left for questions, so uh, maybe one or two more here. Um, for, uh, forgive me if I'm not pronouncing your name correctly. Uh, German Heslow from Lund University. I've tried to swim with clenched fists. I was hoping that this would force me to focus on propulsion by means other than hands and arms. I was surprised to find that my breathing became extremely difficult. Could this be a sign that I have used my hands to lift my head out of the water? Good good conclusion. Yes, that's <laughs> great insight. And you're doing that strategic thinking. Um, so yeah, it, actually that that is perhaps one value that you might not have considered of, of whole, swimming with your fist closed because it revealed an error in your breathing and that that makes it really valuable from that standpoint because it shows that you're error focused doing that so you find the error and then you figure out a, a way to fix it um, then you should be looking okay so why was I reliant on my hands why was <laughs> I reliant on support or bracing for my hands and the breath um, it's very likely because you were lifting your head so you've got to examine that and I would also suggest that as an alternate to halt, to swimming with fist closed that you swim with just one finger extended. You'll get a whole different uh, experience of things with just a single finger. I I've, I used to do a lot of fist closed swimming and I did uh, fist gloves for a long time and now my favorite way to uh, heighten my hands awareness is to just have uh, the index finger extended. Yeah. Um, another thing is uh, the breathing technique that you've become accustomed to using. There's probably a little bit of head lifting, there's probably a little bit of pushing down with the hand yep. and when you switch to the uh, the fists and experience the sinking, 
well, there's probably some component of breathing that is um, a technique element of the breathing itself, not just where your hands are in breathing, but getting comfortable with your face being a little bit lower to the water. Um, one thing that I caution all my swimmers is that when they make a change in their swimming that affects their balance, their breathing is going to feel different. And if someone uses the breathing sensation as their main determinant of whether or not that was a good change to make, they may be limiting their progress. Uh, so for example, you take the hands away and turn them into fists, um, you're not going to be able to sort of rise up in the water as much um, if you're pushing down with your hands. It doesn't mean that your breathing's actually gotten worse, it simply changed the sensation that you have. So it's a way of, uh, of identifying an error, a uh, way of introducing um, an instability in your stroke so you can find something to work on. Um, and so I want to encourage all my, my swimmers to not get frustrated when that happens. There's an awareness that they've developed, and I see the, a range of emotions from anxiety about it, like, oh, I just broke my breathing, <laughs> you know? So I'm not going to swim with fists anymore. I'm not going to do that drill anymore because now I can't breathe. But, you know, that's kind of a fixed mindset. I'm comfortable here, right? I want to get better with my breathing, but this change I just made broke my breathing, so I'm not going to do it anymore. Yeah. Uh, don't, don't avoid errors. Do <laughs> things that reveal errors. It's incredibly valuable. Yeah. So uh, I, we're about out of time for questions, but I just want to finish with your last comment, Terry. Revealing errors. Do things that help errors come to the surface. And that can be any number of things. You can um, you know, swim with the fists, or you can do a particular drill, or try a drill that's um, specifically very challenging to you. Or press um, the left button on your tempo trainer. Or press, yeah. So by pressing <laughs> the left button, you're increasing your tempo. Can or you the right button. If you press it enough times, that will always reveal errors in your balance and stability and so on. Yep. You get up into that range of 1.5, 1 1.6, 1.7. Mm-hmm. Yep. So don't be afraid to go too slow. Um, thanks. I want to thank everybody for coming and showing up. Um, I want to thank Terry for uh, helping me host this this hangout, and I hope you guys enjoyed it. Um, thanks again to uh, the uh, Finis and Endurance Films, our two um, uh, equipment and corporate sponsors. Uh, you guys, everyone who registered for this will get an opportunity to download seven free swimming videos by Terry. Um, Terry, could you tell us a little bit about those seven free videos and also tell us about the upcoming Swimmer, Swimmers Academy? Well, first of all, Suzanne, I want to say you were an absolutely Kaizen host and moderator <laughs> for this talk. It was great. Um, and, uh, well, uh, I, I, the, the seven free videos are going to be embedded in a series of seven articles that kind of explain the development of form and the history of how we arrived at um, the, the rationale by which we arrived at the, for instance, the, the BSP pyramid, as we call it, uh, the Balanced Streamline and Propulsion Pyramid. So the videos will be brief illustrations of how each of those skills um, um, affect your stroke and improve your stroke. There will be also be some, some video of, of Tim Ferriss on there and, and me swimming and... Uh, it's just going to be very entertaining and informative and enlightening and uh, edifying. Mm -hmm. I agree with that. I, I opted in myself just to see what Terry was up to, and uh, from the time I got the first email, I had a, a complete sense of relief that I knew that it was going to give me a lot of um, uh, stabilizing thoughts, a lot of anxiety-reducing thoughts about swimming. Um, Terry, tell us about the upcoming Academy, briefly. Uh well, the, the, the Swim Academy, I, I think it's going to be uh, as groundbreaking as Total Immersion Technique was um, when we introduced it in the, in the early 90s and, and continues to be. It's, it's just going to be an all-new way to improve your swimming and learn about swimming and become um, a master uh, on the cognitive side and the physical side of swimming to really understand things. Um, and uh, it's going to be online coaching but also online um, examination of the whole thinking process of swimming. Uh, I'm excited about it. it mm -hmm. We're going to be uh, filling it with uh, a whole range of courses. Uh, there will be a library in there and a range of courses and you can select um, make up your own course or take a pre-designed course. Um, mm -hmm. it, it's well it's going to be worth checking out. It sounds like it. 
Um, great. Well, thanks again. And I want to remind um, everyone to uh, check the follow-up email because there's going to be some special offers in there. Special offers are deals from uh, our sponsors, uh, Finis, uh, uh, Endurance Films. Uh, I am also offering a, uh, a set of uh, swim practices that are TI focused and TI based with uh, some follow-up emails on how to best use those. And um, there will be a replay. So if you want to watch this again or forward it to one of your friends, uh, please don't forget to check your emails. So thank you very much and have a great night. And I wish you all much improvement in your swimming. Happy laps. <laughs> Thanks. Good night, Terry. Good night, Suzanne.